So uh, <coughs> we have now seen that this centralization of uh, of uh, let's say companies to serve uh, the centrally located parts of the market can cause certain uh, certain certain negative welfare effects for for those who are let's say in the outskirts of this uh, this market uh, there are some examples of this uh, this behavior one <coughs> one is the let's say sharing the common pool of customers issue where you have shops with uh, with different products uh, but sharing the same, let's say, pool of customers. That is one quite strong reason why we get these big, big shop shopping malls uh, in in many areas. And even the transport costs, even if the transport costs can be quite high to get there, uh, many of them. At least they use they are many of them are located quite distant from from uh, let's say urban urban centers. People go there because it's uh, there are scale effects connected to to visiting all the shops, and there are scale effects for the shops as well because they they uh, they get access to a, to a larger pool of customers. Same mechanism here, <coughs> but these are more. Let's say slightly more homogeneous products, cars, than uh, if you compare shoes and uh, electrical articles, which are very different. But still, these are not homogeneous products. Cars, car brands are different, and uh, and hence they have the some some of the same mechanisms. A larger common pool of customers, but weak direct competition because people's preferences are are often uh, quite segmented be between car brands but then you have the you have some substitution effects which gives a rationale for uh, for sharing a uh, a common pool of customers some may redesign and Hence, you have a certain probability for for getting extra customers uh, for your products. Airline departures, <coughs> uh, where you have an obvious type of behavior towards what we call clustering. When um, this local airport got two airlines for the for the main route Moldoslo in I think it was back in 2009 everybody was happy because the prices would go down I was not happy because I was uh, dependent on uh, late night departures from Oslo to Molde to, to get home in the evening at the beginning the two players, it was not, uh, SAS is still around, this one has uh, been, uh, been uh, merged by SAS, but now we have, have the second one, Norwegian, serving Moldoslo. In the beginning, they clustered around the market in the morning, which is strong, and in the evening, or early evening, afternoon, which is also strong, to get to and from work in Oslo, for instance or meetings or whatever. So they located sort of in the middle of the market in the sense that you have the market in the morning and you have it in the afternoon and they located in the middle. Try to capture market shares that way. And the customers that were left, let's say, a bit outside of this market center in quotation marks, market center, that wanted to go in the middle of the day or in the late evenings, 
they were not served. So I calculated that this clustering in the in 2009 to 2011 costed me around 50 nights at uh, at an hotel in Oslo. Because I wasn't able to get home in the evening. But they understood that the the market in the for evening departures was so was of such a magnitude that that they started to uh, to offer uh, late night departures in I think it was in 2012 or 2011, so it has improved a bit. But the tendency is clear. We only have relatively thin markets in the within air transport, and you get two airlines serving that market. You get the clustering in the morning, in the afternoon, and nothing in between. I have mentioned TV programs. And you could also add, and that is controversial, I've discussed that with a friend of mine who is a political scientist, but you can actually argue that also political parties are moving towards the middle of the market. Yes, it is. They, uh, <coughs> there is a the uh, competition authorities that uh, that uh, monitors merging merchings and acquisitions so that the market concentration is not not uh, too large i have my viewpoints on whether they do their job properly or not i think they have been perhaps not too strong in some in some circumstances. At the time when these two merged, the new one, well, a relatively new one called Norwegian, was was around. They were in the in the, in their early 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 phase. Uh, but the most serious merger in the airline industry in Norway was between SAS, the big one, which was the big one at the time, and the smaller one called, uh, it's called Vidura. It serves all the small airports in Norway, smaller than Molde, with the aircraft of between 37 and uh, 50 seats, some 75 seaters. That merger <coughs> made SAS in power of serving all the or many of the of the routes from let's say Oslo to let's say uh, Trondheim, and then further on with this, uh, this other company that they merged with. So they got a l jump in market shares, which made it very hard for this, uh, this uh, competitor Norwegian to, to actually be able to, to compete uh, with them. But then <coughs> they, um, the competition authorities did one good thing. They banned the loyalty programs that the airline had in Norway, airlines had in Norway. Do you know what the loyalty program is? Yeah. yeah. And that ban was lifted in, uh, I think it was in 2012. Then they accepted, or uh, maybe 13, they accepted it again. But they banned it for a period of uh, more than 10 years to facilitate <coughs> the, let's say, the growth of the competitor, Norwegian. And that policy, I think was quite successful. Didn't they also regulate the prices because Norwegian was so much cheaper than SAS, so they said that you if you can't have these cheap prices, you will have to charge a little bit more? That's an interesting question. I will show you in a minute how it, how that how that worked. 
and I will uh, also talk a bit about it was not a regulation but it was a uh, well I think they I they were reminded about what could happen if they continued because they went into a price war It was a predatory, or it could look like a predatory policy from SAS. Mm. And there has been some uh, some legal uh, some trials in uh, Norway and uh, in the U.S. and I think also in Germany about predatory pricing. It's very hard to provide hard evidence for predatory pricing. So, but uh, but they were convicted. Uh, on one of the Norwegian routes, SAS was convicted to to do predatory pricing against Norwegian. <laughs> they, they were convicted because it it turned out that the <coughs> that the SAS guys had uh, had uh, access to Norwegian's uh, computer system, so they had perfect information about all the prices, and that was. Not the predatory pricing as such, but uh, but illegal behavior in terms of uh, actually spying, which was. Uh but when it comes to political programs, then <coughs> uh, one uh, one example is that if you if you if you if you look at politics, and I have no I have no scientific evidence for uh, for this statement, but if you look at political parties. They may start out as competitors, quite far away from each other on the beach. But when they come into position and they need to address, let's say, uh, they need to cope with the market, they are fighting for re-election to, to, to stay in the office, they tend to moderate themselves. You can now look at this party, Syriza, in, in Greece. It started out as a very populistic party. They are now moving into the center and moderating themselves. We have an example from Norway, <coughs> where we have now um, one part of the government is by the Progress Party, which were totally Populistic, and they have now, at least some of them, have moderated themselves safely towards the center of politics. And uh, and uh, as an economist, you could uh, could ask yourself, why do they do that? It is because of some t kind of rationality. The market is there, the voters are there, and I will try to be re-elected, in a way. It's a shorthand version. And my friend, who is a political scientist, he. He says, no, that is not the way it works. But uh, I think he is reconsidering a bit his, uh, his, uh, his views on that, actually. Because uh, there is a kind of rationalism that works well together with, with this hoteling location game. This is just a picture. It's... it's uh it's a helicopter view of, of the car dealers located here in a small area of Oslo. Uh, different car brands all over the place here, but they are located in, in fairly walking distance from each other. But now the <coughs> land use costs has increased. So this car cluster is now replaced by residential areas. So it's uh, they they are about to move and be replaced by uh, by uh, flats for people, which has a higher willingness to pay per square meter, and that type of uh, of uh, location behavior will be dealt with in in a subsequent lecture when we talk about about uh, bid rent models. That is a very good framework for understanding location of different activities in an urban area.
But some of it has to do with scale effects, as I have mentioned. This is another example from, from, uh, from the airline industry. This is the route Oslo Stavanger before and after deregulation. Before deregulation, one competitor was allowed to have three departures during the day, like this. After deregulation, nothing happened in the afternoon, no extra service from the competitor. Then this is a fairly dense route, much traffic, so they offered a bit during the middle of the day, but most happened during the afternoon and in the morning. And the competitor tried to capture market shares by trying to have their departures slightly before the competitors. Here locally, Molde, we go to Oslo in the morning. There is one departure at 6.45 and one at 7. And the reason why they are clustered so tightly together is that they try to they try to win 50% each, as we saw from this, uh, this uh, previous slide with uh, the location in the middle. Not one at 6 and the other one at 8.30, but both very close together. At the time when most people need to go to Oslo to attend day meetings. Yeah, so this is again, as for Weber, uh, a simplified story, which becomes quite messy if we introduce more players and, uh, and more dimensions. But it works as a, as a way of, or a, a way of thinking around these things. And if you use your, uh, or observe, behavior, location behavior in, in uh, urban areas, in certain markets, I mentioned a few, you will recognize elements, many elements from this, uh, this uh, hoteling theory. But <coughs> here we are in this uh, price war case, which you asked about with Norwegian and SAS engaging in, uh, in, in, in this price war. And uh, it also works with, let's say, price war on, on fuel, which we see from time to time. And that works, it works this way. This is uh, <coughs> a situation from the previous slide, where two companies are located in the middle, where the market is strongest. But, and you have the transport costs again, but they try to fight for market shares still located in the middle, but they reduce the prices down to rock bottom, where one of them go bankrupt. And this uh, price war between Norwegian and SAS, the airlines, uh, was very aggressive some 10 years ago, 2005 to 2006. And at that time, Norwegian was about to go bankrupt. They have started to, to get a good position in the market, and SAS feared that competition a lot, so they started the price war. And uh, the competition authorities, they didn't do anything. And then, uh, <coughs> then I wrote a, uh, a small paper, which I sent to one of the main papers in, in Oslo where I said that if they are not agreeing upon a kind of uh, ceasefire in this price war, Norwegian will go bankrupt. And that is perhaps in the short, in the very short-sighted interest of SAS. But then, you should, uh, then SAS should ask what will happen in the next round. Then Ryanair, or EasyJet 
or any other big low-cost players in Europe will most certainly enter into the Norwegian market. The high income level, high willingness to pay, and a lot of air traffic. I don't know what the reason was, but within two weeks the prices were up with 30%. And uh, there was still around two, two airlines. I don't know whether that paper was the reason, but I like to think about it that way. <laughs> So, so, and uh, and it goes. It's the same for, let's say, pre petrol price wars, where you can actually end up with uh, prices close to zero in this very fierce competition. But uh, the price wars on on fuel is a bit artificial, because the big oil companies they like to run price wars in smaller cities, let's say smaller regions to gain a kind of attention and then they just call it off because they have they are so powerful they have so much funds so the danger of a, a real bankruptcy is next to zero but they do it for some i think it's for some advertising reasons or what, whatever to, to to it's hard to see the pure economic rationality in that I want to finish a bit earlier today uh, because of some uh, a meeting that I have to go to. So this will be the final slide, and I will post uh, the direction notes afterwards. Uh, variants of the same products they have incentives to locate close to each other, uh, but there are dangers with uh, with that and. One thing that I need to add is that homogeneous products like air transport services can be differentiated in a way by introducing uh, loyalty programs, by introducing different in-cabin services, different rules for flexibility when you buy your air tickets, and lots of, let's say, add-on services that makes the products a bit different. So if you look, about, uh, look at it, even homogeneous products, providers of homogeneous products, tried to make them stand out as different from the competitors. When uh, the big Norwegian oil company Statoil introduces an offer to the customers that you can get you can buy a cup of for for containing coffee costs hundred and something Norwegian kroner and you get the coffee for free for the rest of the year right that is a way <coughs> of making a homogeneous product different from the competitors because if you stop at start for purchasing coffee then they know that they don't they also purchase petrol at the same time it's a very smart way of creating customer loyalty competing firms will most often from at least from time to time have a price competition and uh, they try to locate distance from each other from that reason it's not very often that you see petrol stations at the same side of the road, very close to each other. But they can also create that distance by introducing add-on services, like cheap coffee. So we can also, instead of talking just about geographical distance, we can talk about strategic distance. That they cause, that they create differences between products by, for instance, adding on services. The welfare effects, <coughs> no air departures during the middle of the day is an example of that some people who have preferences for that, they will suffer if you get the clustering in the middle of the market. So you can 
try to look around and uh, and uh, see if you can see traces of this uh, this theory in the actual behavior that you can observe. Yeah, that's it for today. Thank you.